the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have not done enough. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. For he will talk to me. Turn to me and be gracious to me. For I am lowly and afflicted. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me never be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it will be forever. Amen. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. For you will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from Exodus chapter 8. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. And the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. As he goes out to the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people, and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. When my enemies turn back, may the one perish before your presence. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. Now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if, <coughs> if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor, in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. And he said these things. A woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is the gospel of our Lord.
Lord Jesus. Amen. Our God is a God who speaks, but who really listens to him? Being a called and ordained servant of the word, I have plenty of opportunities to talk with people. Walmart, a bookstore, coffee shop, dentist's office, you name it, I've had a, t a conversation with someone there. Wherever there are people, there's someone with a question for a pastor. For them, or for many people, wearing a clerical collar is an open door invitation. And I love this part about being a pastor. In the course of the conversation as we talk, they usually ask, so where do you serve as a pastor? And I can tell them, First Lutheran Church in Paola. In response, I'll often turn the question back at them as well. Where do you go to church? Do you have a church home at all? But then comes my favorite question. Why do you go to that church? This really gets at the heart of where the person puts their faith. Why do you go to church? Why do you go to a specific church? Quite often, though, I find, or what I don't find, something lacking in their responses. Some of the most common responses I get are something along the lines of, I really like the atmosphere there. They have a lot of activities for the kids. It's the biggest Methodist church in the KC area. Why wouldn't I drive an hour from Osawatomie to go? But what's missing? Where's Jesus? It's like playing Where's Waldo with churches. Does God ever go to your church? Our God is a God who speaks, but too many Christians are listening to other voices. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it, but too many churches keep the word of God safely on the bookshelf right next to the other history books. Sermons are TED Talks. Evangelism is replaced by social justice. And the only cross seen in that church is on a pair of bedazzled blue jeans. All criticizing aside for a moment, people who put in the effort to go to church, to any church on Sunday morning, do desire some blessing from God. Whether they hear the word of God or keep it, that's another question. But to focus in on that for us, how do you individually how do we as a congregation hear and keep God's word? Let's break this down into those two parts. First, how do you hear God, God's word? Our gospel reading from Luke 11 begins with a man who could not hear God's word. Our translation said that Jesus was healing a mute man. The Greek word for mute and deaf is the same, kophos. And if you think about it, this makes sense. If you can't hear or if you don't hear, then you don't know what sounds to put together to make what we call speech. Like so many modern Christians, if you never hear what church is supposed to be about, if you never hear the law that convicts and condemns each and every sinner, if you never hear the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross to save you from all of your sins. If you never hear this, you'll never speak this. So the first great challenge addressed in our gospel reading is a very simple thing. Hearing God's word. The deaf, mute man could not hear. He did not choose to hear God's word or believe in it. The miracle didn't come out from him. It came from Jesus. When God's word is spoken, it demands a listening ear. Jesus spoke to this deaf, mute man and healed him. The God who created those deaf ears was able to speak to those deaf ears. Our God is a God who speaks, and he will be heard. But then there is the natural question. 
Why isn't every deaf ear opened? Why do so many in our world turn a deaf ear to God's word? In our gospel reading, there were three different responses to the miracle. The first group marveled at the miracle and believed in Jesus. These are the Christians who hear God's word and go to church because they do believe God's word. The second group blasphemed against God. They attributed Jesus' miracle to demons. These are the unbelievers who totally reject God's word and only go to church for activism and self-affirmation. And still others, the third group, needed more convincing. They wanted the magic show to go on. These are the folks who go to church only for the show, for the atmosphere, for the entertainment factor. Now, all three groups heard God's word, but only one out of the three believed. Why? Now, there is a difference between deaf ears and hard hearts. One is prime and ready for healing. The other rejects medicine, rejects the healing that is offered. Just think of Pharaoh in our Old Testament reading. Pharaoh saw the plagues, one after another after another. Ten whole plagues he witnessed, and still he refused to repent or believe. Pharaoh heard from his magicians who couldn't keep up, and still he wouldn't believe or repent. Pharaoh heard Moses and Aaron day after day after day as they preached God's word to him, but he would not repent or believe. Why? Because Pharaoh had hardened his own heart against God's word. It was like he plugged his ears and ran around screaming at the top of his lungs anything to refuse God's word. But how do we avoid this? How do we hear God's word? This moves to the second part of keeping God's word. What does this mean? The same Greek word, philoso, is used for keeping God's word, and it's also used in verse 21, where the strong man guards, philosos, his own palace. Now, think for a moment about a guard on duty. Do they make one pass around the property? Do they check a few of the locks and then check off that thing on their uh, clipboard, go back to their office and say they have successfully guarded the whole property the entire night? No. Of course not. Being a guard is an active, ongoing, returning, vigilant thing as you go back to the same place again and again and again to make sure everything is in order. The same is true for keeping God's word. You can't simply hear God's word once, check that box on the clipboard of your life, and claim that you have kept God's word your entire life. It does not work like that. Keeping God's word means a continual return and vigilant looking at the scriptures to hear God speak once more. This is why we, as a congregation, follow what's called a lectionary. This is a schedule of readings so that we can keep on hearing all of God's word. This keeps us from just cherry-picking our favorite verses out of the Bible, or, even worse yet, ignoring the hard parts of the scriptures. But what about you on an individual level? What keeps you from keeping God's word? If I sent you each away for five minutes, I'm sure you could come up with quite a list of reasons why you don't read God's word daily. It could start with simple intimidation of the book itself. Your Bibles have 66 books within that one book, and these are by various authors of ancient times and far-off cultures. Your Bible is hundreds, if not thousands of pages long. That's pretty intimidating when you think about it. 
Add to that a world that loves to intimidate Christians. Christians are on the out. You're told that you can be a Christian in the public workforce, just say as much as the mute man before the miracle, right? As the cherry on top, we have busy lives and busy schedules that leave very little wiggle room for us to dive into a book we already struggle to understand. But just for a moment, what would it look like to keep God's word daily? At an average reading rate for, for an American, if you read your Bible just eight minutes per day, you could read through the entire thing in a single year. Just eight minutes. Would you understand everything? Probably not. But if you read just eight minutes a day for a second year, you would understand more. And here's the point. Jesus did not say, blessed are those who hear the word of God and understand it. He said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Keeping God's word is central to your Christian faith. If you hear God's word and don't keep it, then you're like a house that is swept clean. Sins are forgiven and cleared out. Demons are evicted and exercised, and the whole place is spick and span. But if the house remains empty, if our service this morning ended right after the absolution, then you would have a false sense of security. You've heard God's word. Check. But your demons would go out and they'd find seven more demons, more evil and wicked. What are these demons? Paul listed them in Ephesians 5. Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking, and idolatry. Sin is crouching at your door. It's on the welcome mat. This is eager to move in. And this is why we must continually be in God's word, hearing God's word, and returning to God's word. Now the question, where can you return to God's word? You can't open your Bibles once again, that's wonderful, but there are even better places to go than your Bible. Where might these be? The best place is right over there, your baptism. In your baptism, God's word was not just a book of ancient times and far-off cultures. In your baptism, God's word was placed onto you. God's word came to you. It was spoken over you, and you were joined to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even if your infant ears, even if your adult ears didn't understand God's word and were all but deaf to it, God still spoke. And like the deaf man in Luke 11, God's word makes ears listen. Along with your baptism, return to the words of Christ. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. In this Lord's Supper, the word of God is spoken. And Christ's body and blood are joined to the bread and wine. Will you understand all of this in one time of taking the Lord's Supper? Probably not. I'd be surprised if you did. But this is the word made flesh for you to taste and see that God is indeed good. No longer are you just a swept house, but you are filled up with heavenly food. In these sacraments, you hear God's word and keep it, and you are blessed indeed. So next time you're out and about and you get talking about church, if someone ever asks you, where do you go to church? Mention Jesus. Bring up God's word. Our God is a God who speaks. As Christians, we listen to his word and we are blessed unto life everlasting. In the name of Jesus, amen. We stand for the offertory.
In our prayers this morning, we remember the family and friends of Heather Croucher. Heather was the, was the wife of Pastor Mark Croucher, who served First Lutheran before me. Uh, she uh, was called to her eternal rest on Wednesday afternoon. Visitation will be tomorrow and the funeral on Tuesday morning in Raymore, Missouri. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, guard the souls of your people against the devil and all his angels who afflict the world. Arm your Christians with spiritual weapons, sharpen their tongues with the words of Christ, and overthrow all the power of the devil. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, Pharaoh refused to heed your judgments against Egypt and repent of his evil. Give your church godly patience to hear your words of rebuke in faith, to repent of our sins, and seek the forgiveness you eagerly extend. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, you call mothers and fathers to imitate you and lead their children in the way of light. Strengthen them to flee all immorality. Instill in their families a repentant spirit and a lively hope. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, direct the hearts of our leaders and teach them to respond faithfully to the dangers and disasters that arise. Lead them to humble themselves under your hand and serve their people sacrificially. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, creator of all things, you govern our world for our good and for that of your people. Provide seasonable weather, preserve us from plague and famine, and enrich us by the fruitfulness of the earth according to your gracious design. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Father, you have given us your own spirit in our baptism into Christ. Defend us from all spiritual attacks. Guard us in body and soul. Help those afflicted by any adversity and lead them to renewed strength and peace. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord God, by the sudden death of Heather, you have shown that your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor your ways our ways. We thank you for the blessings of both body and soul that you bestowed on her. Comfort the members of her family, Mark and Zeke, who mourn her death, and assist us ever to prepare for your final su summons that we may depart and be with Christ in blessedness and glory of heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Lord, you join your word in the bread and wine, and so invite us to eat and drink. Grant that we may, so, that we may hear and keep your word in faith, that we may worthily receive the true body and blood of our Savior, and so be given your eternal blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
Greg has an update on uh, the call process. Thank you, Pastor. We had a reply this week from Pastor Wellmer at Vassar, and he wants to be read this letter this morning. Dear members of Trinity Lutheran Church, greetings in the name of our crucified risen Lord Jesus Christ. Receiving the call to your congregation is a humbling experience. Thank you for your confidence that I could serve you well as your pastor. The call documents and accompanying materials have arrived, and I am in the process of reviewing them. The information they provide will be helpful in forming a picture of the congregation and its mission. I will be in contact with you soon to discuss the arrangements for a visit. I am looking forward to learning even more about the people and ministry of Trinity. I promise to give serious and prayerful consideration to your call as you sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit in extending the call. So now I ask the same Spirit to guide me in my deliberations so that the will of God for his church might be done. I hope to reach a decision within three weeks. Please remember me and my family in your prayers as we include you in ours. Please also pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Matthew 9:38, Luke 10:2. In Christ, Pastor Joshua Wilmer.